Hey friends, welcome back to Midweek Encouragement. Pastor Kevin here with First Church of God, and I'm glad that you can join us. Yeah, it's a little bit cool here in Oklahoma right now, so I got my jacket on just to stay a little bit warmer. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're staying warm and comfortable. I want to talk to you today. And you see, in the church, we feel it's very important that people come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And so we talk a lot about that on Sunday mornings and Wednesdays or anytime that we're together. We always want to give the invitation for people to come to know Jesus which is great because we don't want them to go to hell. We don't want them to be in eternity separated from God. We want them to know Christ. But what about that in-between time, between coming to know Jesus and then that one day of getting to be with him? It's a lot about growing in that personal relationship. It's kind of like um, having a friend. If you've got a friend, you've got to agree that you want to be friends. Um, I often refer to this whole thing of having Jesus uh, as uh, having a personal relationship or making Jesus your forever friend. For a friendship to work, it requires a transparency between two people. It requires spending time with each other, uh, dropping our guard. It requires a desire to have a friend and it has to have a lot of guarding the friendship from things that would damage it. Knowing Jesus as your forever friend is more than just making a trip to an altar and saying a prayer. I believe it's seeking him and spending time with him on a daily, if not hourly, basis. He's with us always, and he's always ready for a conversation with us that is not hurried and not interrupted. Someplace in my shed, there is a plastic tub. Probably has some dust on top of the tub, but if I figure out which tub it is, I, it's going to take a while to explore which tub it is because it's not marked on the outside. But there is a grayish-brown box, a cardboard box. And inside that box is every letter that my wife, when we were dating, mailed to me. We were several hours apart from each other for a number of years or a number of months, and we would write each other on a regular basis. I still have all those letters. Isn't that neat? Now, those letters really just tell me a little bit about her and about what's going on and what our dreams are and, and things of that nature, but they don't really tell me who she is. Uh, we had to move from that place of letters to marriage to get to know who each other were. The letters let me know what she liked to do and things that she wanted to do. And it's a totally different thing from letters to marriage. Now, we can read the Word of God, and we should read the Word of God. We should meditate on the Word of God. Or I, I like the way somebody put it recently, marinate in God's Word. Yeah, we, we need to let it soak into us so that we know about Him, but it's also a way to get to know Him. Spending time with God is so important. Now, for me, I call this place majesty. Uh, it, it's someplace special. It's not something I can really teach you. I can just tell you about what happens within me when I go to the secret place, when I dwell in the presence of the Most High God. Have you ever had something you just couldn't find? You misplaced something, a, a watch, a ring. <laughs> the other day, I couldn't find my cell phone. <laughs> and and I had put it on silent, and I just couldn't find it. And I asked my daughter to, to call it, see if I could find it. And all of a sudden, I'm feeling it vibrate on my hip. Yeah, it was that close. But what do we do when we can't find something? It's always where? The last place we look. Why is it always the last place we look? Because we don't go looking for it anyplace else. We have found what we are looking for. Um, Jesus said, if you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. And throughout the Bible, we have these people that God has spoken to, and they write down what they hear. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing to have been Moses and seen and heard from the burning bush that didn't burn up? Or anybody else when they hear God speak? But here's the thing. God is still speaking. He's still speaking to those that are willing to listen. Now, I want you to understand something. The word listen, in fact, you might want to write this down today. Write down the word listen, L-I-S-T-E-N. Do you know those are the same letters for the word silent 
just rearranged. Same, same letters, different words. And I think they have a lot in common. And I believe that God is calling us to be still and know that he is God. We are called to slow down and listen. I consider it a privilege that God allows me to share with people what he has spoken to me in my prayer journal. So when I am in my time of majesty, when I'm in prayer, when I'm in this quiet place with God, I journal what I am saying, and I journal what God is saying to me. So when I am speaking, it's in cursive letters, always in pencil, something about the drag of a pencil. But when God speaks, it's always in block capital letters. It's in majesty. And I like to share from my journal what God is saying, because I think people need to hear that. One time I shared from my journal and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, where did you get that book? <laughs> it's just a prayer journal. I, that particular journal had bought at Silver Dollar City. Come on, it's just a prayer journal. It is God speaking and God is still speaking today. You cannot find this any place else. It's not available in stores or on TV offers. Yeah. Uh, some people wonder, how can you tell the difference between the voice of God and bad pizza? Hmm. My answer? the price. In the Old Testament, there was a prophet by the name of Elijah. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, he is face to face with this very wicked queen. Uh, and, and going up against them, Elijah the prophet, he challenges the prophet of Baal's. Uh, Baal's a false god. And the challenge or the showdown is this. You guys are going to build an altar. I'm going to build an altar. You're going to sacrifice an animal. I'm going to sacrifice an animal. But whosoever God sends down the fire, we can't use, we can't throw any fire on it ourselves. God, your God has to do it. And whoever's fire does it wins. Pretty severe challenge. Pretty big odds. Now, here's uh, it's amazing to me that uh, um, the prophets of Baal, they work really hard. They're cutting themselves, and they're dancing, and they're singing, and they're shouting. Elijah taunts them a little bit and says, uh, maybe your God's sleeping. Maybe you need to talk louder. Maybe, maybe he's gone on a trip. Maybe he's using the restroom. He's just not available to you right now. Nothing happens. So, Elijah, it's his turn, and he builds the altar up. He puts his uh, the animal that he's sacrificing on it, and then he does something really weird. He says, go get some jars of water. Not just jars of water, not a mason jar, but big vases of water. And they saturate the altar with water. It's amazing how God can turn water into lighter fluid. <laughs> water into wine, water into lighter fluid. But all of a sudden, God, Elijah prays and God sends down fire and it consumes everything. The water's gone, the rocks are gone, everything is gone. Do you realize that rocks melt between 11,000 and 1,100 and 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit? And which is amazing to me, why didn't everybody that was around get consumed by the fire as well? It had to be some intense heat. Another thing that doesn't make sense is that after God shows his power, why does Elijah run? Elijah runs for his life. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9, he is running. And, and, and it says, There he went into a cave, and he spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord. God Almighty, the Israelites have rejected your covenants, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out. And stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the wind, uh, shattered the, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then the voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So what voice did Elijah hear? It was a gentle whisper. What kind of voice or what kind of tone does God the Father use when he speaks to us? I have a friend that uh, I helped. And uh, he and his wife were having a terrible time communicating with each other. But what we discovered what the problem was, 
his tone of voice. And when he changed his tone, she began to hear. And the marriage is something phenomenal now. But what do we hear? Uh, I'm reminded of Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, against such things there is no law. So one of the beautiful things about God the Father is that he speaks to our heart through each of these as we need to hear them in our life. So the question may be asking, so, so what is the fruit of the Spirit? The, what fruit of the Spirit is God the Father wanting to develop into you at this place in your life? What if you worked at listening for his voice speaking to you in that particular way? For example, if God wanted to develop in you joy, maybe you would start hearing his voice as joyful. I think as we grow in intimacy with the Father, his voice is always going to be deeply affectionate towards us. For me, it's not so much a whisper as it is just this gentle and loving, compassionate voice. Oh yes, the Father can be correcting at times, but he disciplines or he corrects those that he loves. But when he wants for me to rest in him, to slow down, he'll even speak to me slower than at other times. And he will call me his child, and he will tell me to rest in me, soak in me. As a believer, uh, Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. And what the Father does is he loves to speak to his Son who is in you. And he speaks to his Son. As he speaks to us, he's speaking to his Son. And so no matter what type of day we are having, there is a confidence in his voice. Now, I want you to be reminded of something. Over three, 365 or 366 times, when God speaks in the Bible, he always opens up with, fear not, fear not. And once you recognize his voice, you don't hear the fear not anymore. You just know it's him. And it's gentle, and it's loving, and it's kind, and we don't need to be afraid. And we just need to say, okay, here I am, Lord. I want to hear you. So there's this invitation to be still and know that he is God. I think that sometimes... He loves to begin with by saying, my beloved, which may be a little bit hard for us to hear sometimes when we've been called other names, that we don't recognize such a compassionate uh, voice. We've been called all these other things and put down so many times over the years that it's tough to hear my beloved. But keep in mind, since he inspired it to be written down, he's going to speak in gentleness. Also understand this, God's voice is always going to be in the voice that we need to hear it in. But God's voice is always going to be gentle. He inspired one of the writers of the Old Testament to write down, a gentle answer turns away wrath. You ever had somebody come at you and they're kind of angry? You want to change their day? Start speaking softly to them. Start speaking gently to them. It turns, it turns things around. Gentleness is not weakness. It is actually strength under control. So when people are irritable, be gentle back. It turns things around. The gentleness of the Father opens us up to learn from him. In Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, it says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He is in the transforming process of you to become more and more like his son. What would it look like if you sat down and you had your prayer journal and you began just writing, My Beloved, and then you got quiet and listen for what he wants to say to you. It's going to be an affectionate and beautiful, gentle voice. The Father wants to settle us and he wants to reassure us on, uh, on a very deep and emotional level that he cares for us intimately. And he wants to release us from any fears that we have. Fears that we say, well, I just don't measure up. Are you needing peace? Listen to his voice. It's going to be... That's what it's going to sound like. It's going to sound peaceful. Needing patience, you're going to hear it slowing down, and you have to listen. He is patient, not wanting anyone to perish. He's wanting you to slow down and take your eyes off of your agenda and put them on the Almighty. And the beauty of his voice is this. As you sit with him and he with you, and as you allow him to speak into your heart, your heart begins to fill up and overflow. And then what comes out of your mouth is no longer your words, but his words. 
And we begin to speak out of the overflow rather than out of the emptiness. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We are to guard the heart, allowing into it only what we choose to allow into it, which ought to be the voice of God. We are we are called by God's word to guard our heart, for it is the wellspring of life. So what are you, friends? What are you allowing into your heart? The enemy wants to come in with a different voice, and we have to speak back to that voice, telling it to get out of here. I, I think another way of maybe asking this question is, if the words of your mouth were written on your face, would you still be beautiful? And if the answer is no, then you're allowing something else into your heart. And it's not the voice of God. How does God speak? I think God speaks in one of three ways. Either through his word, the Bible, a godly friend, or a still small voice. What is his tone of voice? It is one of the fruits of the Spirit that he wants to develop in you. So what would it look like if you were to be quiet before the Lord, no sounds around, just you and him, and your mouth and mind, they stop. And you open your spiritual ears to him. I encourage you, write down what you hear because you will not want to forget it. It is so important. It may be a few words that he's already written. It may be one word. Or it may be a whole page. You don't know until you become still and know that he is God. My friends, go listen. He wants to talk to you. Have a great day.